good morning. Good to be together this morning. If you have your Bible, open up to Romans 12, where we were last week, and we will get there in just a moment. I want to remind us before jumping into Scripture this week, the whole point of taking about 10 weeks to go through spiritual gifts is for practice. It's not to develop head knowledge, though developing head knowledge is important because the knowledge that we have informs the decisions we make and the things that we do. So we do want to gain knowledge, and yet the purpose is not that we would leave here after 10 weeks with more knowledge about what Scripture says about the way that the Spirit works and the way that the Spirit gives gifts. And to sit here in December and just say, wow, we learned a lot these last few weeks. Really good to have this information up here. The, the whole point is for practice, to put in, to effect, to practice in our lives the gifts that God has given us to honor and glorify Him, to build up the body of Christ so that more would come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so this week, we're going to wrap up kind of these first handful of weeks, which will cover about 11 spiritual gifts. Uh, the next couple weeks, Dave's going to teach next week on unity of the body from the end of 1 Corinthians 12, where it talks about the hands and the feet and us all having different parts, but how they all come together. In a couple weeks, Castro is going to teach on 1 Corinthians 13, the, the, the big chapter about love that we often quote at weddings and things like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, the chapter about love comes right in the middle of spiritual gifts, and so it's in that context that Paul is actually speaking, writing to the church in Corinth. It's not in the context of marriage or romantic relationships. It's in the context of spiritual gifts in the church. And then we're going to come back in three and four weeks and touch on the two gifts that sometimes create a little bit of confusion or different perspectives on both prophecy and the gift of tongues. And so um, that's where we find ourselves in this spirit, in this series of walking with the Spirit. And so with that said, would you stand with me for in honor of the reading of God's Word taken from Romans chapter 12. This is the same passage that we read last week. This week we're going to focus on three different spiritual gifts. So Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. For by the grace given to me... I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning seeking a greater level of understanding of the spiritual gifts. Again, not so that we might build up our own personal knowledge or intellect, but so that we might build up the body of Christ and bring you honor and glory. Father, I ask this morning that you would speak through me, that you would take a weary and tired mind and soul to be a conduit of your word this morning. Would you work in us and through us as we seek to honor you in all that we say and do? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. So this past week, uh, I believe it was Friday morning, I was out uh, in the morning, like Haley and I usually are, taking care of animals, spending a few minutes together, enjoying a nice hot cup of coffee, um, when I received a text message from Sarah Lee. Many of you know Sarah. I asked her permission to share this story. And on this particular morning, I was out alone. I think Haley had left early for something, and so 
I was out alone. She sent me a voice message. And the effect of the voice message was I was praying for you this morning. And I believe the Lord gave me a vision that I want to share with you. She explained the vision that she had been given. She pointed to a place in scripture that she felt like God was calling her to and explained how this vision connected to this part of scripture and how um, she wasn't entirely sure um, why she was supposed to share that with me, but she felt inclined to do so and she was being faithful and obedient to share that with me. And I could tell you that about four or five things that she shared with me were extremely connected to either things that had happened last week, things that were on my mind, things that I was struggling or wrestling with. And on that morning, this spoke to me in a way that was very clear to me, but not very clear to her. Come to find out as I'm in conversation with Sarah that a few months ago, she was at a place with people who don't belong to Trellis Church. And someone said, I think that God wants me to tell you that he has given you the spiritual gift of prophecy. And I urge you, I implore you to pursue that. And over the next several weeks, as Sarah read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where it says, earnestly desire the spiritual gift, especially that you might prophesy. She said daily she fell down on her knees in the morning as she was in her quiet time saying, God, this feels different. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was you who spoke to me, but I'm reading your word, and your word tells me to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. And so I am here asking, imploring you, God, if that is a gift that you would desire to give to me, that you would be faithful in giving me that gift, and I would be faithful in the handling of that gift. And, you know, we're going to get there in a few weeks to talk about prophecy and what that means and and why I think there's a difference between how uh, the authors of Scripture mean the office of Old Testament prophet versus the way that Paul talks about a prophetic word in the New Testament, and why I think those two things are different, and we'll have conversations about that. The point of sharing the story today is actually not to implore this church toward prophecy, but to start out this morning by just saying, I am so grateful and thankful for the work that God is doing in and through this body. I mean, last week as we prepared for service and Zach and I were talking, we we're like, let's just give space to see if God might be wanting to exhort this body in some way, shape, or form, thinking like, okay, maybe one person is going to be courageous to come and stand up front. And we had five or six people who felt like the Lord had given them a word uh, either a, a scripture or just a word to encourage this body who stood up here and in an orderly fashion to honor what scripture says, share those words of exhortation. And I can tell you that I talked to numerous people this last week who said, man, what this individual shared is exactly what I needed to hear this morning. Or what this individual shared reminded me of something that I've been thinking about for years and I, I finally feel like I have the strength to step out and take a step of faith and to take action based on what the Lord spoke through this individual. And so friends, through exhortation, through a, a, a gift, as I just shared, that, that God has given to Sarah that she's trying to be really faithful in, in, in responding and being obedient to, God is working, he is moving. And I just wanna, I just wanna say thanks, but this isn't actually about me saying thanks. <laughs> This is about God saying, I'm, I'm moving, I'm stirring, I'm at work, and us being faithful and obedient to those things. And so this week, we're going to kind of wrap up this first section of spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about three spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about generosity, we're going to speak about leadership, and we're going to speak about mercy. But before jumping in, let me just um, explain that I'm going to move through these three gifts pretty quickly today, not, not quite as in-depth as I've done these last few weeks for two primary reasons. One, I want to spend a few minutes at the end just talking about some steps that I think we should practically be taking as a church. If you haven't already, um, 
to encourage us individually and corporately to do that. But secondly, Mary is going to be um, sharing a testimony at the end of service today about how over this past year, through certain challenges and struggles, she's learned more about listening to the voice of God and how God has been encouraging her and, and using her in this difficult time. And so I'm going to jump right in, and it's going to feel a little bit like we're flying through these, but I think these three spiritual gifts are a little bit more self-explanatory as we read them. So first, generosity. I want to acknowledge before talking about the spiritual gift of generosity that there is a command in scripture for all believers to be generous. Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. We literally actually have an apple on this table over here from a gentleman in the community who brought that this week to honor the Lord with his first fruits. And at first somebody's like, haha, that's funny. It's a I mean, he wanted to be responsive to what he felt like God had commanded him to do. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. James chapter 2, 15 and 16. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? I could go on and on, but the point here is, as we jump into this spiritual gift of generosity, I want to acknowledge here that that we would be mistaken if we walked out of here today and said, well, at least God didn't give me the gift of generosity, therefore I don't have to be generous because it's not my spiritual gift. No, God has commanded all of us to live generously. Additionally, there's a temptation for some of us to say, well, I don't have very much. I'm not rich, or I don't have a lot of resources. So God wouldn't choose me to have this spiritual gift, because if it's about generosity and I feel like I have nothing to give, then, then why would that gift be present in my life? Well, Mark 12, 41 through 44, and he sat down opposite the treasury, speaking of Jesus, And he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make one penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So God makes it very clear through this story that that Jesus is not suggesting only those with great material wealth or great financial wealth can contribute in meaningful ways. In fact, this widow who gave one penny had given more than everyone else combined in the eyes of the Lord. That's how God thinks about generosity. So we're all called to be generous And don't think just because you don't have extra or available resources that God might not choose to bestow on you the gift of generosity. And so here's my definition for the spiritual gift of generosity. The supernatural desire, willingness, and attitude to use one's personal resources to meet the needs of others. Okay, this is a desire. Now, all of us should work on this desire. I've shared with you in the past, I'm naturally someone who kind of struggles and wants to like hold on to the things that I have earned. And through Haley and through other generous people in my life, gotten to the point where I can honestly and earnestly say, I have a desire to be generous. That desire, if it comes really easy and natural to you, might be some inkling that God has has given you the spiritual gift of generosity, because for most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, give my hard-earned money away, can I pass on that? And so if this, this is an earnest desire of yours, it might be significant that God has given you this gift, a willingness, okay, so that walking through life instead of holding on to what we have, we willingly live with open hands, which allows God to both bless and trust us to store the resources he's given us, but also allows us to be generous and to give away. And, and the attitude, the attitude is a, is, a, is a big thing here, guys. 
God knows the conditions of our hearts. And sometimes we feel like when we give reluctantly, it's like as if we could hide our reluctance from God. <laughs> he knows our very hearts, friends. He, he, he knows before you even think it. So it's important that we recognize the desire, the willingness, and the attitude. I also want to point out here that I'm intentional in this definition to say use one's personal resources. Now, the church has resources to be generous. Those are your resources that have been budgeted in our church budget to invest in community, to invest in ministry, to support local and international partners, to provide Thanksgiving baskets to school districts and to do all of these kinds of things with it. And, and those resources are available and those resources are there as the body. But if you've been given this spiritual gift, the gift of generosity, I, God is calling you to use your personal resources as well to be generous with others. And friends, this plays a really important role in the church. I have the privilege of getting to walk with people in this church as they walk through financial hardship. And the church supports them, but I've also seen this body do amazing things to support financial needs in the context of this church. And when you do that, friends, you are ministering to, you are encouraging, you are blessing your brother or your sister in Christ in ways that you probably don't even know. I've, I've sat with individuals in my office, I point to this office, but it's former offices, who have been in tears sobbing over the generosity of this church and what this church has done to lift them up, to carry them, to walk with them in times of financial hardship. So, so this gift ministers in profound ways to the church, but it also speaks volumes to those outside of the church. Think of the stories that, that we have to tell, that we have to share. The story of someone who maybe has walked through financial hardship meets someone in the same condition who says, how did you do it? And they said, my brothers and sisters in Christ belong to a church body that genuinely cares for one another. And when I didn't have a car, somebody provided. When I couldn't pay my rent, somebody provided. When I didn't have groceries to provide for my family, somebody provided. When I didn't have a shelter, someone provided. That's what the body of Christ does. Think of the ministry that that is to those who are like, I got nothing and nowhere to turn and nobody who's to lean on. It's a tremendous ministry to those outside of the church. And so Friends, this spiritual gift of generosity is vital for the functioning and the thriving of the church. The second spiritual gift we're going to go through today is on leadership. And friends, there are many definitions of leadership. Some suggest leadership is about your character. Others believe it's about what you accomplish. Some argue that leadership, it, it, the relationships are the most important aspect of leadership, while others would say, no, the tasks that you get done far outweigh the relationships you create. Leadership is about getting stuff done. I could go on and on, but the point here is that there's no single definition of leadership that we can all just, you know, rally around and agree on. I've heard this phrase numerous times that I think is kind of funny, but I actually think is pretty spot on. It, it goes something like this, and this is my summary. If you think you're a leader, look behind you. If nobody's following you, then you're just out for a walk alone. You know, it's kind of funny, but there's, there's something to be said about this. I'm leading, and you look behind you and nobody's following. You might think you're leading, but you're not. <laughs> but this highlights something that I believe Paul had in mind when he wrote about the gift of leadership. It's all about the influence that we're having on other people, particularly in, in the context of Romans 12. It's about our influence on our brothers and our sisters in Christ who exist as part of the body with us. Now, spiritual leadership can be practiced outside of the context of the church, should be practiced outside of the context of the church, but Paul is primarily writing here about our influence on our brothers and sisters in Christ. But what kind of influence? Well, this is where the definition comes in. We're going to define the spiritual gift of leadership as the supernatural ability to influence people toward two things, 
deeper relationship with God and down the path that God is leading them. So the supernatural ability to influence people toward deeper relationship with God and down the path that God is leading them. And this happens, I believe, in general ways which are applicable to all Christ followers. And it happens in specific ways based on your context and how God is leading the specific body of believers that you are a part of. And so what I mean by that is that those with the gift of leadership have this general influence over other people, regardless of the season, regardless of what's going on, regardless of how God is moving the church. And this influence is just about deepening other people's relationships, influencing, inspiring that, and also calling people to the path that God has called them. And and that's generally applicable in all circumstances, in all seasons, and in all contexts. And yet there's a specific aspect of leadership here that is really based on how is God leading this person? How is God leading this church? And in the way that God is leading this church today is different than the way that God was leading this church 10 years ago. And so the gift of spiritual leadership is necessary to lead people in different ways, in different contexts, in different circumstances. So let me touch on these things real quickly. In a general way, this is all about living out the commands of Scripture, which are applicable to everyone who profess faith in Christ. Someone with the gift of leadership inspires you toward a life of prayer. They lead you into deeper desire to understand Scripture and apply it in your life. The spiritual leader encourages you through setting a personal example of what it means to live as part of God's kingdom, sacrificially, placing yourselves before others. Sorry, placing others before yourself. Got those two words backwards. Pretty significant difference in meaning there. Submitting to God's authority and remaining committed through life's ups and downs. And so the one who's been given the spiritual gift of leadership just inspires this in all seasons and all circumstances. And friends, these are things that we all should be doing. Each one of us is called to do this in the lives of our brothers and sisters. But the one with the gift of leadership has a supernatural ability to actually influence in this way. This is vital for the church. Now, in a specific context, the question might be, what are the things that God is doing specifically within the context of the local church that you belong to in this season. And so those with the spiritual gift of leadership are able to help others understand what God is calling them to. So as we've been in what feels like a relatively long season of transition between buildings and the changes of lead pastors a couple years ago and all of the things that are included in that and in between, the one with the gift of spiritual leadership is able to help us understand what What is God calling us to? Why is it important? Why is the direction of this church and the way that God is leading this church, why should that be important to you as an individual, as a member of this body of believers, or as someone who might walk in the door the first time as a visitor, and how it's connected to God's kingdom? That's really important. I hope you want to be part of a church that's directly and divinely connected to what God is trying to accomplish. And it's important that those with the gift of spiritual leadership understand in this season, God is calling us to this thing or these things, and here's how it's connected to the bigger picture of God's kingdom and what he's trying to accomplish. So some really simple examples. Some churches tend to be more focused on international missions while others invest heavily in their local community. That's fine. That's fine. Those with the gift of leadership need to help the body understand why a leaning in one direction or the other is important in this season. Some churches focus on prayer, while others have service built into the core of their DNA. Some might go through a season of increased discipleship within the body, while others might put extraordinary effort into evangelism. These things aren't contrary It's not that we as a church choose one or the other. Am I going to do evangelism or am I going to do discipleship? Am I going to do missions locally or am I going to do missions internationally? They're not opposed to each other. And yet in seasons, God might be leading a body to lean more heavily into one. And the spiritual leader 
exists in part to help the body understand why that's happening, how it's connected to what God is doing, how it's connected to his, to his leadership. A spiritual leader is able to influence people toward each one of these goals based on how God is leading the church in that moment, in that season, in that context. And so the one with the spiritual gift of leadership generally leads others and specifically leads others or contextually leads others. Friends, we all need someone with the gift of spiritual leadership in our lives. And I'm not talking just about at a corporate level as a church. We need to rub shoulders with those who are going to influence us, encourage us, inspire us to these things in our personal lives as well. How many of you are naturally inclined to have perfect self-discipline to move yourself closer to God and further down the path that he's leading you? I don't imagine many of us would lead, would raise our hands in favor of answering that question. Oh yeah, everything naturally inside of me is like every day I get up and the first thing I think about is, you know, how can I move into a deeper relationship with God and what's everything that I can do to, you know, we, we wake up in the morning and we grab our phones and we see what's on our schedules today and the calendar and as we go throughout the day, we spend so much time focused on the task at hand and what we have to get done. That's just our, our natural characteristics and natural temptation to place ourselves above others, to place ourselves above the needs of the church and we all need people investing in us to inspire us, to influence us to deeper relationship and to walking down the path that God has called us to. That's spiritual leadership. So we've gone over generosity and leadership. And the third gift we're going to go over today is mercy. Typically, we describe mercy or we define mercy as withholding something, often punishment, from one who deserves it. And so mercy is used in scripture in relationship between God and us, that us in our natural state of sin, we naturally choose ourselves over the things of God. That is called sin in scripture. That fractures the relationship between us and God, deserving punishment. God said through his word, through the writings of the apostle Paul, that we all deserve death as a result of our sin. Yet God's mercy with holds that punishment for those of us who put our faith and our trust in Jesus as Lord. And that's often how we think about mercy. But in the context of what Paul is writing here, I believe a better translation for this word, at least in how we think about words in English, would be compassion. Paul used the Greek word for mercy here, but I think what he was really referencing was this gift of compassion. I don't believe that Paul was writing about a spiritual gift that withholds punishment from one who deserves punishment. There's a few reasons for this. First, generally speaking, as Paul writes about spiritual gifts, he's writing about something that we do or something that we would receive rather than something that we would withhold. But secondly, the phrase here is with cheerfulness. Those with the gift of mercy practice it with cheerfulness. This also suggests that the one with this particular gift is, is doing something, is offering something. It's not about withholding something. Finally, the way that this particular Greek word is used throughout scripture is in the context of giving something, is in the context of showing something, is in the context of bestowing something upon someone else. And so, so I'm going to keep using the phrase, the spiritual gift of mercy, because that's how it's translated in scripture. But I think really what's going on here is Paul's talking about compassion. So I'm going to define the gift of mercy in this way. The supernatural desire and capacity to identify with, comfort, and show compassion to those experiencing distress, pain, or suffering. The supernatural desire and capacity to identify with, comfort, and or show compassion to those experiencing distress, pain, or suffering. Once again, this is something that all Christians are called to. We're all called to identify with, to show compassion to those who are walking through a difficult time. 
Yet there are some who have a supernatural ability toward compassion. When most of us drive by the homeless person on the street and think, maybe I'll stop next time, they probably wouldn't use the money for good anyways. The one with the gift of mercy feels deep pain as if they were homeless themselves. While most of us would see the drug addict strung out on heroin on the street and think, what a fool. The one with the gift of mercy agonizes over what possibly could have happened in this individual's life to lead to these types of decisions. When most of us think, serves you right. When the wife or husband who cheated on their spouse has served divorce papers, the one with the gift of mercy aches and grieves over the loss of marriage. Friends, we need this spiritual gift in the church. But unfortunately, I'm going to step out on a limb here and say most of us don't believe that we will experience this kind of gift when we experience pain, distress, or suffering. What I mean by that is that most of us are going to walk into the church and assume that if we are experiencing great pain or distress or suffering, we are not going to be met by someone with the gift of compassion. And I know that this has to be true for at least some of us because I'm aware of how much you hide, <laughs> of how much I hide, of how much we hide when we're experiencing these things in our lives ourselves. Friends, if we knew that we would walk into the body of Christ carrying grief and pain and distress and suffering and someone with the gift of mercy, who is this gift of compassion, would greet us with a hug, would sob tears as we sob, would just sit and listen sometimes, maybe when you don't need someone to fix your problems, but you just need someone to listen, would connect with you and relate with you, who one or two weeks later would send you a text message, would call you on the phone, would say, hey, I'm still praying for you. I haven't forgotten. How's it going? You want to talk? Grab coffee? Have lunch together? Is there anything I can do? Ah, it's going okay. You know it's so, and then you check back again and again. <laughs> because God has given you this gift of mercy, this gift of compassion. One of the things I've spoken about, I think pretty consistently for the last few years is this. I crave for this body to be a place where everything is welcome where everyone feels like they can be open, where we can all feel like we're gonna, we can be vulnerable without being judged, where we feel like our mess is other people's mess, and where we feel like we'll be met with compassion and mercy rather than judgment or anything else. Just this morning as we were praying before church, one of the volunteers today prayed, God, if there are people who are walking in here this morning with hurt and pain, would you just minister to them? Would you be with them? And I want to echo that. God, would you minister to them and would you be with them? And I also want to say, would you place people with the gift of mercy and compassion in this body? Or would those who might already have the gift of mercy and compassion in this body rise up and say, I, God's given me the gift of mercy and compassion. So we know when we need a shoulder to cry on, we go to the right person that we can be met with the compassion that we need. Might this be a place where people feel like their mess, their struggle, their hurt, their pain, their suffering is welcome, is welcome. So friends, I, I just, I've been praying very consistently, even when I don't feel like I want to pray, that these gifts, these 11 gifts that we've covered the last four weeks the two more that we're going to cover in a few weeks. There's more spiritual gifts than that. Depends on who you're asking or who you're reading, whether there's 12 or 14 or 18 or 21. It's very possible that there are spiritual gifts that Paul didn't write about in the New Testament. I, I don't know how many spiritual gifts they are. I, I chose to focus on these because they're in the context of two specific passages we're using in this series. But I, I just want to continue to encourage us, continue to implore us, to the outflowing of these gifts as part of the body of Christ. 
And so I'm going to conclude my time here this morning by encouraging us with five steps toward action. Five steps that if you have not begun taking these, I want to say start taking these today. And I'm not saying that as an authoritarian tyrant who just wants to stand up here and bark orders. I'm saying this as a humble servant of the body of Christ who desires to see others benefit from your gifts to build up the body of Christ. And selfishly, I want to benefit from your gifts as I benefited from the gift that, of the word that God gave to Sarah this last week. So this is all about the building up of the body of Christ. So five steps. Number one, ask God to reveal to you the gifts that he has given you through the Holy Spirit. If you haven't done that in the last four weeks, I encourage you to do that today, tonight, tomorrow morning, the next day. God, would you reveal to me, would you help me understand the spiritual gifts that you have placed within me through the power of your spirit? The one, the two, the five, however the Holy Spirit decides, would you reveal those to me? I shared at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. This, this phrase, earnestly desire, could maybe more accurately be translated as pursue. It's a phrase that was used by Greeks back in the day as a hunter chasing after its prey. I don't know how many hunters we have in here. I'm not a hunter, but I've talked to enough hunters that when you are out there, you are doing everything you possibly can to encounter whatever it is that you're hunting. Sometimes that means sitting silent for hours at a time as you call something in. Sometimes that means walking dozens of miles trying to find where the herd is. Some, I, I don't know all the details of this, but, but I, I think... When you're hunting, you're not just sitting in your backyard with a BB gun hoping to find something. There's like really intentional effort. You are pursuing something. That's the way that this phrase was used by, by Greeks. Earnestly desire, pursue your spiritual gifts. So friends, if you have not already, ask God to reveal to you the gifts that he has given you through the Holy Spirit. Secondly, practice, practice, practice your spiritual gift. Practice it. I know that sounds funny because we like have been taught or we assume that, pra that spiritual gifts is like something that only happens spontaneously. And yes, the Holy Spirit does work spontaneously. Or we've been taught that there always has to be some sort of emotional experience in the implementation of our spiritual gifts. And yes, sometimes when we're using our spiritual gifts, we have an emotional experience. But sometimes we practice the gifts that God has given us so that he might use us to understand how he's speaking, to understand the circumstances and situations that he might choose to use our gift. And, and so I want to call us to practice this. Can you imagine what it would be like to, with great anticipation, give someone the most amazing gift that you could possibly think of and have them do absolutely nothing with it. I mean, think of, of saving up of all of the thought that goes into like, what would this person appreciate to the lengths that we go to to give someone the perfect gift for them on their birthday, and they're like, eh, thanks. They just kind of toss it beside them, and it ends up in a pile of other junk in their garbage. Can you imagine what that would feel like? I mean, you'd be like, oh my goodness, the effort that I put in, the money I put in, the thought that I put in to get this gift for this person. And it, that's what happens when the Spirit gives us gifts and we're like, I don't want to go through the effort. It makes me kind of nervous. I'm not sure what's going to happen, and so I'm not going to step out in faith and just trust that this is the Spirit working. I mean... When I was 16, it might be different today. I didn't have a single peer who would have been given the gift of a car and just let it sit in the garage. I'm too afraid to drive it. I don't want to get a dent on it. 
No, you take that thing out. And I had a 1973 Volkswagen Bug that I was driving like a BMW. <laughs> Sliding into the parking space at high school, you know. But why? Because I had inherited this gift from my grandfather to his children, from my mom, to my older sister, to my brother, finally to me, this bright yellow 1973 Volkswagen Bug that l drove like a Porsche. I'm telling you, this thing was awesome. <laughs> awesome. I wouldn't have in a million years just thought, I'm just going to let it sit. I think I prefer to walk the five miles to school today. No. God gives us gifts. They are to be practiced and used. And the only way that you're going to use them is by doing, by practicing. Number three, communicate with God before, during, and after practicing your spiritual gifts. So we ask for the gift. We, we ask God to reveal to us the gifts that he's given us. We get, be, begin putting those into practice with courage, with anticipation, even if we're nervous. And when we're using those gifts, before, during, and after, we're praying, we're communicating with God, we're seeking his wisdom. I shared a couple weeks ago the story of blue, pan, blue jacket and khaki pants. Multiple of you have said to me over the last couple of weeks, blue blue jacket, khaki pants, kind of as, as a joke. I mean, I'm, I'm communicating with God. If this, is, if this is what you really want, give me the courage to do this. As I'm uh, approaching this bench, hoping to have a conversation with this individual, God, would you, in this moment, use me to, to speak whatever it is that you want to speak? After the fact, I'm, I'm communicating with God. How did I maybe miss that opportunity? What could I have done differently? What should I have done differently? Is there another way that, that I could have approached this? Your gifts, friends, are to glorify God and to build up the body of Christ. Don't you think God wants you to be successful here? I mean, God is cheering for us. He gave you the gift to implement them successfully to glorify his name and build up the body. He wants you to be successful. Talk with him. Ask questions. Share your frustrations, your struggles. Ask for greater clarity. Beg him for more courage if that's what you need, more willingness to take a risk. Ask for confidence in the implementation of your gift. So for those of you who have been given a gift, if you know what that gift is, uh, I'm encouraging you, talk with God a lot about it. Before, during, after. Ask for more wisdom. Number four, be extra open and attentive to God using the spiritual gift he's given you in the context of this church. Again, he could and probably will use your gift outside of the context of this church. I pray that he does. Whether it's with other believers you know, in the context of your neighborhood, at work, I, I don't know. But... Paul was writing about these gifts being used in the context of the church. And so if you call this church your home church, if you look around and you consider the people who are here and others who are not here today to be your brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to encourage you to be extra eager and open and excited to use your gifts here. It's part of the reason why Zach and Kasra and the staff and I are being intentional about trying to structure our services, the order, the liturgy, the way that we do things to give space to God using the spiritual gifts to build up this body. Again, this isn't the only time that you can use those spiritual gifts, but all of us together in this type of setting usually only happens once a week for about an hour and a half. And so we really want to take advantage of the hour and a half that we're together. We want to ask God, if you have something to say through an individual, say something. If you desire to show the gift of compassion to someone who's struggling, lead that person to do that. If someone here is struggling and the gift of generosity is needed to lift them up, to build them up, speak to the person with the gift of generosity. If you have a word of knowledge for someone to, to show that you are real, to encourage them, to build them up, through the person who has the gift of knowledge, would you be at work? 
And so the kind of thing that we did last week, inviting people to ask the Lord if, if they have a word of exhortation for this body, is actually something that we want to build into the DNA and the culture of our time together each week. So much so that we don't ultimately have to say, well, today during the last five minutes of service, if you ha that, that it's just built in and the people here know if God is speaking and moving, uh, I'm, I'm going to go up to Joseph or Castro towards the end of the service and say, I feel like God is doing this. If you feel encouraged to go and speak to another individual that you feel like is hurting because you have the gift of compassion, just go do it. You don't have to be invited to do that. So we want to be extra open, extra attentive to God using your spiritual gifts in the context of this church body. And fifthly and finally, I've said this the very first service of this series. Stop asking, what if it's me? And start asking, what if it's God? I talked about this the first week, how all of us, all of us have the propensity when we feel like we think we're being urged to do something by the Spirit, almost every single one of us, this is the question that goes to our mind. What if it's just me? What if it's just me? And friends, when you ask that question more times than not, you will come to the conclusion that it is just you and you will do nothing. That's like 38 years of experience of my life. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't recall having urgings from the Spirit when I was a toddler, but that was, that's my adult life, a functional cessationist who believed in the works of the Spirit, who believed in the gifts of the Spirit, but would so much prefer to just pawn it off as it's probably not God. And so I want to encourage us to start asking the question, what if it is God? What if it is God? Because what if it is God leads to a thought process that is more likely to get you to act on that. I heard a story this last week as I was listening to a, a sermon on prophecy and kind of preparing some of my thinking for uh, a couple weeks from now. And he, uh, the pastor shared a story of a really good friend of his who was on like a two-hour train ride from New York City to, to somewhere else in New York. And he felt this like really strong urging and desire that he was supposed to say something to the woman next to him on the train, very specific to a line of work that she was in and, and kind of a word of encouragement. And he thought, wow, I've got two hours on this train. I'm going to wait till five minutes, no, three minutes, three minutes before the end of the train ride. I'm going to turn and say something to her so that if it's completely awkward and flops, we're like right about to get out of the train. But he kept feeling this sense of urgency. And so he turned to her and he said, ma'am, this might sound really, really strange. Uh, I feel like God is encouraging me to say something to you. And it is blah, blah, blah with your line of work and, you know, these things. Does that mean anything? And the woman looked back at him and said, nope, absolutely not. I don't even work in that line of work. And so I don't actually even know what you're saying. And he's like, okay. And then sat awkwardly on the train ride <laughs> next to the woman. But you know, as he processed this, what he said was, I have learned from that. It's given me courage. I learned that it's not so bad to have someone look at you and say, I don't actually know what you're talking about. And you know what? What, what if it... What if that was the case and I didn't say anything? And, and it's part of my process of discerning how to hear from the Spirit and, and how to discern His voice from my voice. And it's, it's all part of this walking with Jesus, trusting in the Holy Spirit aspect. So I encourage us, instead of saying, what if it's me, to ask, what if it's God? Band, would you make your way back up here? I want to be clear here before moving in toward communion and worship. And I don't think I probably need to say this, but I also want to be clear. In this season, where the leadership of this church feels very strongly that God is leading us and guiding us toward a greater level of trust in the gifts of the Spirit, a greater level of reliance, a greater level of anticipation, this does not mean you discount all the other things in Scripture. <laughs> not, I'm not saying that we don't live life wholly dependent on the Word of God as absolute truth. I'm not saying the things that God calls us to in Scripture that don't seem perfectly 
connected to how God's using the gifts of the Holy Spirit are things that we ignore. Well, there, there's a lot more to the Christian life than simply just trusting every day that the Spirit's going to work, and if he doesn't, then we get to the end of the day, and like, that was a worthless day. There's Friends, there is so much more to the Christian life than the implementation of spiritual gifts. However, spiritual gifts are an important part and a part of the early church that was completely normal, expected. So I want to continue to just encourage this body in the ways that God is moving here. We're going to move to a time of worship, a time of communion. And as I say, most weeks during the last two songs, as you feel led, we have communion elements on both sides here. Feel free to partake. If you are not yet a believer, if you have not put your faith and your trust in Jesus as Lord, we would ask you to just uh, participate in worship. Use this as a moment to think and reflect upon what you've heard, to think and reflect upon what you feel or believe about the person of Jesus. For those of us who have professed faith in Christ, we believe what the word says, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that the gift is eternal life for those who put their faith and their trust in Jesus. So we take communion each week as a reminder of the cross, in response, in obedience to what God has commanded us to, and to participate in some way in the mysteriousness of how the Lord's Supper draws us into deeper relationship with him. So I'm going to invite the band to lead us in a couple songs. As Zach concludes, he's going to pray for us and then uh, invite us to sit down as Mary comes up and shares a part of her testimony this last year and listening and hearing the voice of God. So would you stand with me and worship?